So I think that actually did it. Return to Dr. Shen Yang. Optional. I think it's too late for the optional data to make Penelope Wong join us. Let's just get the fuck out of here, everybody. Search suits. Rows and rows of finely tailored suits, custom shoes, and various accessories filled this room, of course. What a profitable run. Take the elevator to the mezzanine. I'm about to leave this location, return to Hioi. The clink of glasses and sound of Neville Ma's party fades into the distance as you leave the Repulse Bay. As the MTR carries you towards Tioi, the mountains of Hong Kong Island roll by as looming masses, obscured by rain and storm clouds. While Penelope Wong is still attached to promises of moonlight, the circumstances surrounding Neville Ma's recovery should provide plenty of fodder for Dr. Shen Yang's blackmail plans. With Ku Feng dead, Ma will find himself without his most poor, powerful ally and unable to protect himself from Shen Yang. And we prove that I'm not a liability, just like befriending all the supernatural shit we bump into. Sometimes I'll kill people. For karma. For karma, thank you. Oh man, did we level up? Everybody leveled up from that? Red Samurai gains Shuriken. Damage 12. Gaichu gains ranged ability. Spitting infected saliva into the target's face ignores all armor. Pow. By which I mean, we'll do the others first. Duncan's subduability has its cooldown reduced from three rounds to two turns. Well, we forgot to use it at all, so let's not do that. Duncan gains an assault rifle ability that has a 99% chance to hit an enemy who is less than 15%. Holy shit. What do we got here? Isabel gains a pistol ability that increases accuracy by 30% and a critical chance by a small amount for one shot. Neat. Integrated tactical computer marks weak points in an opponent's armor. Isabel's marked target now reduces the target's armor by one. Deal. Gobbit's rat totem invocation does 99 damage to any hostile spirit? Jesus. Rat totem invocation can steal control of spirits that have been summoned by enemy shamans. No, I'm just fucking that one. You just bump into a shaman that gets a little lippy, and you just take their power. Well, you don't take it, you kill it. Hello, glaring orc? A diminutive female orc regards you with a sharp, challenging look. The fierceness of her expression contrasts starkly with the sweet, rounded face and neat bob. She flexes her cyber fists. She fires off a rapid-fire reproach in a thick Filipino accent. Why are you staring at me like that? Didn't anybody teach you manners? She plants her fists on her leather-clad hips and juts her chin out at you. Relax, I didn't mean to stare. She gives you an unwavering sidelong gaze. You're a stranger on my turf. I expect people to be civil to one another. This isn't your turf. It's a civil area. And besides, these streets belong to my boss, Kindly Cheng. The York size narrow. You're not too good at making friends or fitting into new surroundings, are you? I got better things to do with my time. Fuck off. Do I have metadata for you, my friend? Then I've got some metadata for you. Yo, tell me what you got. This network runs on information. No, no, because I'm not sure if that'll fuck up our job. Yeah, by law, by. Let's go upload the pay data, because we have actual pay data. Get that shit uploaded. Your workstation, Mission Computer. Access to jobs directory. Nope, go back. Shadowland. Uh, post pay data for sale. Post to Repulse Bay construction plans. Posting successful. Posting will remain active for two days. Beautiful. Let's not dick with our computer till we speak to our dwarf friend. I think he was a dwarf. I'm 99% sure he was a dwarf.
Hello, my friend. Shen Yang is busily puffing away on a foul-smelling cigar, his calm link in one hand. His eyes flash with anticipatory glee as he sees you. Dr. Shen Yang greets you in the name of all producers. How'd the shindig go? Let me tell you about the night we had. You explain the night's events from start to finish, most specifically how you managed to sneak a ghoul in because you're so badass. As you speak, Shen Yang's face grows ever more incredulous until finally his mouth is left hanging halfway open. He slowly places the cigar in a nearby ashtray and shakes his head in disbelief. Well, ain't that a story and a half. Good thing you killed that bloodsucker. Hong Kong's dangerous enough with vampires running around biting actors and producers. That should put a crimp in Ma's business, even if he still has Wong. I bet getting fed vampire blood is pretty addicting. That's what the Sims say, anyways. All right, kid, I'll send payment to your Matrix drop. You earned it. Glad to be able to help. Dr. Shen Yang is about to speak, but his calm look begins to buzz. Irritated, he answers it and switches to speaker mode. Who is it? What do you want? Neville Ma. Hello, Shen Yang. I just wanted to let you know that I've released Penelope Wong from her contract. If you're still interested in her, she's all yours. And I hope your business is doing all right. I heard you have some problems with your cash flow. If you need a loan, I'd be happy to help. Dr. Shen Yang eyes the image of Neville Ma with deep suspicion. You don't sound too mad, Nev. What's the catch here anyway? You must have the next big thing lined up already. Oh, doctor, there's no need for it. Do you know why I keep winning our little contest and you're always playing catch-up? It's because you think people like Miss Wong actually matter. They don't. Stars are crafted, molded out of talent, yes, but ultimately constructed. With enough time and effort, anyone can be made into a star. It's just a question of manipulating public perception. Maybe so, but I got it now, and your show's dead in the water without the star. What do you think of that, eh? I think that I'm doing to... I think I'm going to do what any good soap opera producer would do. Write her character out with a tragic death and bring on someone new. You labor under the misapprehension that viewers have loyalty. They don't. They only have appetite. As long as you chase stars like Wong, you'll lose. Don't be afraid to think bigger, Doctor. Reach for the drama, not the dramatists. With that, Neville Ma hangs up on Dr. Shen Yang. For the next 30 seconds, Dr. Shen Yang releases a stream of violently imaginative invectives at his phone. Even Strangler Bao looks taken aback at the ferocity of Shen Yang's anger and the inventiveness of the sexual positions that he describes. Finally, he takes a deep breath and composes himself. That dirty little weasel insulting my creativity like that, the nerve. Go on, kid, we're done here. Thanks for all your help, but I gotta get going. I gotta talk to a guy about buying a bunch of snakes. Well, neat. We'll check up on... Reliable Matthew, you've moved. How are you? A hover drone loiters in front of Matthew. A stream of profanity is spewing from its scratchy speakers. People nearby are looking away, ignoring the awkward situation. Matthew Cigarello is dead, drenched by rain. He stands with his signature nonchalance, but the edges of his face are twitching. His eyes are wide with fear. You could listen in, but you've already got the gist. Matthew's being chewed out. Hang back and wait. We're polite. The drone speakers finish, and with a shriek of feedback, they clack back in what's hauled. The drone soars up into the sky and races off upriver. Matthew shakes himself off. His cheery demeanor surges back with striking resilience. He leans towards you, a little wide-eyed, but otherwise restored to his usual self. Stubtail Williams! Hardly saw you there. Come on in, don't be a stranger, beautiful. Who are you talking to through that hover drone? One of my suppliers, Quang Ha. Really good businessman, sharp guy. Sees opportunity where most of us only see broken parts. Funny guy. Makes me laugh my ass off. He sounded unhappy. Oh, that's just Quang Ha. He's like a paper tiger. Matthew sways back and forth on his feet, languid and jittery at the same time. He's a big joker, always shouting, but I think he's a real softy at heart. Real big heart for little people. Keeps me well stocked. What's your business arrangement? I sell on commission. Got to keep these bots moving. They don't earn their keep sitting out on the barge. You don't own most of these drones? Matthew's brows arch up in surprise. Of course not. How could I afford them? I'm so lucky to have a guy like Quang Ha as a partner. Only problem is he's got me laughing in stitches so much it sometimes distracts me from sales. I was laughing my ass off over here. Matthew gives you a long, awkward smile. The seconds stretch out. He blinks uncomfortably. When he speaks, his words sound stilted, like he's repeating a mantra. He's a funny guy. Matthew adjusts his suit lapels with mechanical gusto. Phew! What a pep talker that Quang Ha. I feel like I could take on the world right now. Let's take a look at your drones that I don't use. Goodbye. Farewell. Well, his character took an interesting turn. Oh, your young friend's back. Let's talk again. Uh, the three men are once again fixated on their game board and the go game in progress between them. Gin rubs his hand together nervously, his face twisted in concentration. It appears that Xu now has the upper hand. The silence of the game is deafening. 
Amateur players would be filling the air with clicks and clacks of the stones against the wooden playing board, relentlessly trying to outdo one another. These men are different. Shu picks up a small black stone in his hand and reaches over the board. It pauses. Gin stares at his hand, suddenly still. Shu begins to lower the stone. Down, down. Gin is practically on his toes. And then, Shu pulls his hand back. Perhaps not there. He strokes his short beard thoughtfully. Damn it, Shu, when you start a move, you commit to it. I swear, if you're doing this on purpose. Friends, we have a visitor. The two players look up. Gin sighs and holds his face in one hand. He mutters something beneath his breath. Shu's eyes fix on you. He stares unspeaking. His generous smiles and playfulness from before are absent. Uh, sorry to interrupt. I was just wondering if you all still having dreams? This again? Don't you have anything better to do? Yes, we're all still having the dreams. Lao's voice is calm but troubled. However, they've gotten a hell of a lot worse. Look, let's not go into detail. Anything would be great. All right, but afterwards, you have to let us finish our game. Sure. He nods approvingly, then glances at Lao and Xu before continuing. Our dreams have become, uh, unpleasant to say. Dark or violent. He runs his hand along his tightly cropped beard. Not all that healthy, if you ask me, especially for men of our age. We come out of them in a daze sometimes. Feels like we've been punched in the senses, in the imagery. You can see him shiver as he thinks about it. Well, I said no details, so no details. That about sum it up, Xu, Master Lao? I have nothing more to add, Xu. No, nothing. Is everything all right, Xu? You've been staring at me a while. Xu continues to stare at you, his face pale. He opens his mouth, closes it. He seems to be struggling to find words. What's wrong with you, Xu? You better not be having a stroke. We're in the middle of a game. If Xu heard again, he doesn't show it. He looks at you and his eyes widen. You need to go faster. The shadows that follow you are getting closer. Excuse us, Stubtoe Williams. Our friend is tired. Lao clasps a hand on Xu's soldier, who doesn't seem to notice. These dreams have taken a toll on all of us. Please come back to us some other time. Right, take care. Maybe the magic shop has extra armor for us. A heavy scent buffets your senses. The scent of pure, unadulterated book. Woody, musky, dusty. The light herbal incense from before seems like an afterthought in the wake of paper smell. Looking around, you see that the shopkeeper has abandoned her earlier feeble attempts at organizing the texts. Several of the towers of books are now reduced to piles on the ground. A piece of paper caught somehow in a ceiling rafter rustles gently above you. Crafty? You hear a shuffling of paper. An arm rolls out from under a pile of blankets and books, and Crafty raises her head, a notebook spread open on top of it. The books topple to the floor. Oh, hey, her voice cracks. Crafty clears her throat with a cough and stumbles out of her pile. Her voice is clear when she speaks again. Sorry about the mess. I was up all night reading, or rather, up every night reading. Now oh, you look like shit. Crafty lets out a single sharp laugh. I've been better, if that's what you mean. Going through these notebooks has been hard, not just because of the sheer amount of information. It's been a nostalgic ride, too. If these journals are kicking your ass, you can always stop. Your health comes first. No way. I've dug myself too deep to back out now. And I don't say it as a bad thing. I've made progress. I'm proud of that. She leans on a book-covered chair. The sooner I figure out these dreams, the sooner I can rest. And trust me, Stubtoe Williams, I'll make up for it in spades and naps. Well, don't work yourself to death. That wouldn't achieve much, would it? And it isn't all bad. These journals are just as exciting as they're laborious. Uh, what's the latest? The latest. She walks over to a glass table and starts tossing books off of it. As she digs through them, you realize the table is not actually a table, but a glass display case full of dried medicinal ingredients. Crafty withdraws a notebook from the pile. It's binding unraveling. The page is holding on for dear life. Here we go. This one's loaded. Uh, with what? Got a couple big finds. Mom's notes are a mess, so I boiled them down to the most important information. An exorcism and the Yama Kings. Where do you want to start? Uh, the Yama Kings? Tell me, how much do you know about the Yama Kings? I've run across stories about them in my own research from Isabel. Personally, I'd only heard about the Yama Kings in fables and myths, things to scare children to sleep, to inspire awe. As you can guess, intimate knowledge about imaginary beings is largely non-existent, and here we found the demons of the walled city. Through my mother's excursions into the slum, she came to learn that its residents had their own unique Yama Kings, different from the traditional ones. The people here are segregated from the rest of Hong Kong. Over time, they came to believe that their home was possessed by local demons. Makes sense considering the place is Pashaw for crime and disaster. Interesting. What were they like? There were three that Mom knew of. Lam V, Fu Mang, and Queen Ya. Each Yama King is associated with the negative energy on which they feed. Lam V feeds from cowards. Fu Mang from the guilty. And Quan Ya slaves. 
Unfortunately, my mother's handwriting declined with her sanity. She rubs her forehead in frustration. She has a lot of details in here about these local Yama kings, but I could only make out bits and parts. There's a list. Something here about... Her mouth twists sideways and her eyes squint. Rules? Maybe laws of some sort. The thing that stood out to me is here. She plops a finger onto the page. It's about the propriety, propriety surrounding ownership in deals, exchanges, negotiations, luncheons. No, that last part can't be right. Anyways, it says the Yama Kings, under rules or laws, must adhere to the terms of a deal. They can't give an inch without losing everything. She sighs and flips the page onto the counter. Can't read anything past that. You know, it's strange to me that Mama found these mystical beings significant enough to mention in her documents. It makes me wonder if she thought they were real or connected to the curse that she believed in. A thump and crafty closes the notebook. She casually tosses it back onto the display case. It's not the best lead, but I think it's a step in the right direction. Tell me about this exorcism? She flips through the notebook and, after locating the right page, lays the book on the counter. Her index finger glides across the notes as she summarizes its contents. On one of Mom's trips to the walled city, she decided to check out an archway, an old crumbling relic that residents believed to be haunted. Mom wasn't sure about the hauntings, but upon entering the area, she immediately felt that it was a place of concentrated key. I know someone who's mentioned that same arch. She's from the walled city. Crafty looks up in the notebook. I'd believe that. It's a fairly prominent landmark. Seems to me like most people from the walled city would at least have heard of it, if not seen it. What did she say? I can boil it down to creepy. Yeah, I'd have to agree with you there, at least from what my mother wrote. It looked seriously bad. So what happened next? The key wasn't like your standard run-of-the-mill energy. Even for the walled city, this key was exceptionally dark. And it all seemed to gravitate towards the arch. So she did what any kook of her magic brand would try, a Taoist exorcism. Uh, did something explode? You could say that. The exorcism failed and something happened to her. She broke. My mother had entered the city strong, confident, and capable, but when she left that day... It's hard to explain. It's as if the experience left her vulnerable to those base horrors within the walled city. She grew paranoid and became frail of mind and body, a mere shadow of her former self. It's as if she'd witnessed something and it changed her. She became more obsessed than ever, and that's how I remember her now as that broken woman. I'm not sure how this fits in our investigation, but if that sort of malevolence is coursing through the walled city, it's no wonder the people who live there experience such terrible dreams. Um, I was gonna buy shit from you, young lady. Do you have extra clothes? You totally do, but we're dirt fucking poor. We gotta get that thaumaturgic armor. Can you send me a copy of those notes? Crafty taps her finger to her nose. Already a step ahead of you. I just finished digitally transcribing the information. I'll send it your way, uh... She looks around the book cover shop as soon as I find my terminal. Thanks, Crafty. I'll get back to it. We have to go get our fucking payday. So we can buy some new armor for Phineas. Inbox, urgent task, restaurant job. From Kindly Cheng, Two Stub Toe Williams, restaurant job. One of the things I've learned over the years is that even the rich and powerful have annoyances. Thorns in their side, if you will. No one is without troubles. The rich just have different ways of solving them. The client for this run has grown tired of one of the fuck off. This isn't what I wanted. Go back. Go back. Open the jobs directory. Claim payment for finding the data for Mr. Shen Yang. You submit the job is finished and await the response. A few moments later, a message pops onto the screen from Dr. Shen Yang. Good work out there, kid. Here's the money I promised you, Dr. Shen Yang. Only 1100 Barely enough for the armor. But we're going to get it. Let's see what you're selling. So let's see what you're selling. Just enough, I think. Yes. Confirm. Now this is my outfit. How do I look? How do I look? Much more majestic. Look at that. Handsome fella. 